My name is Emilian, I work in the IT industry and we're looking at something like this that's behind me. Uh, we're in a server room or a comms room or a communications cabinet, it goes by various names. And we're gonna go through the basic components of each one or what you would find in a typical server room. So here we got a standard comms cabinet or a server cabinet or a rack, goes by many names, uh, that you'll find inside of a server room uh, or in a data center. Uh, different sorts of doors, different designs. Uh, some are gonna be glass, some are fully covered, some you cannot see inside, others you can. Others got ventilation, others don't. So they really come built uh, to how you need them and customizable to really how you need them. In a lot of places, the doors themselves can be removed, so you can literally just unscrew this uh, and you can remove the entire door because sometimes it may not be possible to get access to certain things. Uh, they're gonna be locked. This particular cabinet is just accessible via a standard key. Uh, other cabinets will be could have fingerprints, you could have a swipe that you swipe on the front to let you have access into that particular cabinet. Uh, as I said, this one is particular key because this is inside of my own building, uh, my own comms room, so I don't need to control my security that much once you're already inside the server room. If this was gonna be in a uh, data center where it's potentially accessible by a lot of people, by a lot of companies, I would look at investing in better sort of security for your actual uh, server the cabinets themselves. Inside of the cabinet, you've got rails on the left and on the right where you can then go and mount equipment separated by these little grooves where I can slot my, my servers, my switches, my routers, whatever into. Uh, they're generally grouped into what's called a rack unit. Generally, it's going to be three, which makes up one RU or one rack unit. And a device that is gonna be purchased will be either a 1RU, a 2RU, a 3RU, wherever it may be. And then you put this accordingly uh, to the left and to the right and you slide that particular device in, you screw it in, or you can get a little clip, a nut and bolt sort of set up or some devices to just clip into place inside of these particular holes uh, on the, uh, the rails themselves. In a lot of cabinets, uh, the rails themselves are adjustable, move them forward and back, really depending on the depth that you require for your particular uh, cabinet. Uh, servers are longer, for example, than a switch, so you may want to be able to move these back and forward to really adjust to that particular uh, device that you're going to be racking. Depending, again, on the cabinet itself, this particular cabinet doesn't have any fans up the very top. Uh, it's just got some ventilation and to allow for my airflow to go up. Uh, there are other cabinets where you're gonna have different exhaust fans. You may have fans on the top, fans on the left, fans on the right. Uh, they all really come in different shapes and sizes really depending on the need and on, on the requirement. So here we got all of our cables that are running in from our building into this particular server cabinet. You'll see sort of through the grate there, uh, essentially it's coming out from the roof, a whole group of cables running from individual people's desks, from their computers, from their phones, uh, from meeting rooms, and perhaps other comms and server cabinets in other parts of the building or different floors. They're all gonna you know, generally terminate in one or multiple locations, and then they're gonna be fed through to, to what's called essentially patch panels. So you've got all the cables running from the top down. They're all nicely cabled through here into these things called patch panels and they're spliced. They're essentially the cables are opened up and they're put into these patch panels right here. So the other thing that's very important is as you can see, everything is nicely cable tied together. And that is generally a very, very good practice. You don't want to be um, messing, you know, imagine a whole bunch of cables just coming down here in a crazy fashion. So having everything nicely organized, patch panels uh, is good. Uh, for me, it's good for morale. It looks nice, it looks pretty. IT people who work in here will like it and it just looks very, very neat. So essentially from here, from the patch panel, on the other side, which we'll look at in a second, it's the cables will then be run into subsequent switches or into other locations as the need requires. The front of the cabinet, you can see that at the very top, you've got all the cables feeding through from the roof and then they're running into these patch panels, blue and yellow. I've got blue for my data, for my computers. Uh, or for data traffic, and yellow for my VoIP or for my phone traffic. 
Each of these particular ports are labeled so that I know exactly around the office uh, if I have a wall point uh, on, my, on my desk or in a meeting room, it should match up to this. So if I look at this particular number, I can go to that wall point and the number should match up. So I don't have to trace, trace cables, they're all labeled on each either end. I've then got all of my cables running from the back they're running from the roof into the back, they're spliced open, and then the other end is then connected to a network cable, which in, in turn is then labeled. These are labeled so that I know what switch they are running into. So each of these labeled cables are gonna be running into a subsequent switch. Um, essentially the switch will then provide the further connectivity into the network for that particular device that is running from the roof into the back of the patch panel, spliced open to the front of the patch panel, running into a particular switch. And here I've got my switches. These are Cisco switches. There are multiple switches and each switch uh, is going to be having a cable fed into it from the subsequent patch panel or directly from a piece of infrastructure such as a server or a storage device or a firewall, whatever it may be. You'll see that what we had before was color coordinated blue for data and yellow for phone. So this particular switch up here is running my cables from my computers, from my phones, is down the bottom on my yellow right here. You see everything is nicely bunched up and labeled accordingly to let me know where it's going to, where it's coming from, and it just really helps it a lot uh, when it is nice and neat. It's spliced to the left and to the right uh, as needed, all bunched up and cable tied on the side so that it looks nice and neat. So here we've got the back of a switch. Uh, you'll see that there are two power supplies. The switch itself is set up with these proprietary cables that are stacked together to, in this case, to a switch above and a switch below. There's also some uh, ethernet ports on here for further connectivity and for console access and configuration of that particular switch. These are the Dell EMCs. Uh, this is a R640 server. Now this is just a uh, really a cover that's on the front of my server which is gonna be removed. The cover itself is lockable as well. And then the cover, essentially right here, is just really to make it look pretty and to have a little badging on there so that you know that it's a Dell. Literally goes into the groove and clicks into place. Again, this is custom to Dell EMC. Other server brands and vendors will have different sorts of plates. Some may not have any at all. If you're custom building a server, you may not even have any uh, sort of badging at all. This is attached to the rack itself uh, and clipped into place. And then I can slide the server in or out. I can then push it. It clicks into place and now the server is stuck in there and is no longer movable. The front of the unit is pretty bare. There's really not much going on. Uh, and that's because this particular server is acting as a VMware ESXi host. So there's no requirements for a lot of the fancy stuff. Uh, this is really just acting as a, um, a server that is uh, running what's called a hypervisor and has the processing power inside to you know, manage multiple virtual machines. This is not a physical, uh, this is a physical server, but it's not running a physical server infrastructure. It's running virtual server infrastructure, multiple servers running on this one box. So normally in a server you would have, uh, if it's a physical, acting as a physical server and needing more configuration, uh, you'd have, you know, a CD-ROM drive or a DVD drive in here, and you could potentially have disks slotted in the front. Now because this is a 1RU server and this is custom built for what we needed it for, there's no requirement for that. Inside of the server there is two um, SD cards which are run in what's called a RAID, essentially for redundancy, uh, and that is what's running the operating system which is ESXi, VMware ESXi, and that's it. So this really does not need anything else other than what we've got configured. Uh, it's, it's acting as one particular service, it is providing a service uh, to the network, uh, it's not really hosting anything else other than that. On this server, you'll see that we've got a couple of power supplies. So we've got the top server right here with two different power supplies. Uh, the reason that we have two is for redundancy and for failover because we obviously don't want one power supply to die or this cable to be unplugged or the other end of this cable to have a problem uh, where then your whole server goes down because then you've got an outage. So you always get the server with two. It's very common that every server, most servers nowadays, will come with two power supplies built in for redundancy. And obviously as part of best practice, you wanna run one power 
out of this to one particular rail of power and then this one into a different rail of power. You don't want them both running into the same power board, your same PDU distribution unit or your same UPS and then you lose that one unit, you actually will lose both. So it's always good practice to have one into one, one into the other so that you have redundancy and failover from both levels. We then move on to our cables. So these are our ethernet cables. These are doing various functions and you'll see that we've got a number of cables up here, a cable here, and we've also got a cable here on the left which is my yellow cable. This cable on the left is a uh, management cable. This is a Dell server, so this is called a iDRAC. Uh, essentially, it's a management uh, cable where I can remotely connect to the, to the server itself and see what the server would see. The same as if I plugged a um, screen straight into it and accessed it, you know, accessed it via my keyboard and mouse. So this just allows remote management of that server directly. I've then got a number of ethernet cables running into here. And obviously there are more than just one network cable for multiple reasons. That could be for redundancy or the server is providing multiple services. It's always best practice that any sort of cabling that you do, you do it in more than one, you do it in pairs or more to allow for multiple levels of redundancy. So you see that I've got one network card here and one network card here. I'm not gonna run all my cables just on one network card or just one network card because then if I lose the network card, then I lose that particular connectivity to the server. So I've got cables running onto two different network cards. I've got redundancy there. And then I've got redundancy on the cables themselves where each network card itself has got multiple ports coming out. These are gonna be configured really to your needs and to your likings uh, as the requirement is needed. They're not being used at the moment, but you've got a comms port right here. You've got a standard VGA port where you can run a screen into it. A couple of USB 3s and then a couple of empty ports where I can plug in what's called SFP modules where I can run uh, fiber into this or ethernet or another sort of peripheral. And essentially these cables, you just put a module inside and it provides multiple levels of um, connectivity depending on what your requirement is. So as I said before, you can just buy yourself another card, peripheral card, which you can just run into here. It could be a fiber card, an ethernet card, it could be a SCSI card if you need to connect, you know, connect to another SCSI device. Given that this is a one RU unit, I am limited in space so I can buy less things for here. If I had a two RU server, I can obviously put more things inside of it. Here we got an example of a NAS. This is a Synology NAS. Essentially, it's a uh, device for storing data. Uh, this is a NAS, not a SAN. I do have another video if you are interested on the differences between a NAS and a SAN. They are different uh, and they provide different services, but really like a server, this is just racked into the side. It's a one RU, this can be expanded so you can have multiple disk trays, uh, you know, storage, array, storage arrays that can be added on top of this uh, to expand the storage on this particular unit. Here we've got a SAN. This is a Dell EMC Unity SAN. Uh, this is essentially a device that contains lots of disks uh, and provides a service to generally to virtual servers, uh, to perhaps a file server repository, whatever it may be, uh, in, a, in a corporate network. Uh, this can be expanded, right? So generally a SAN will be expandable depending on what vendor, what make, what model you're getting. This particular one can be expanded essentially just by disk arrays onto the bottom, which is just connected to the back of the SAN itself, and then you can just expand the storage. Within the SAN, you go and configure the storage groups, the storage pools, the LUNs, whatever you may need to do. You can configure this as a SAN or a NAS, but this is acting as a SAN and is being used for our VMware. So our virtual servers and all of their relevant data all sit within this particular uh, device called a SAN. So on the front is really just a plate, just a cover, with the branding and sort of protects the contents, but I can just easily remove it. And now you can see essentially what's inside. A whole bunch of two and a half inch disks. These are 1.8 terabytes each, 10K speeds, and that's all the ones that I've got in here. 
as well as a whole heap of empty slots and I can easily remove these and add new discs as needed. Once this is full, I then go get another tray, expand it and then go from there. So commonly nowadays you won't get servers with storage or you don't necessarily need servers with storage. You buy these SAN or NAS units uh, and then you have the server storage, essentially the VMs, whatever the file server may be, the repositories are all sitting on separately attached storage devices. If you do want more information, I do have a number of videos on SAN and NAS, really going into the details and the uses for each of them. This is the back of our SAN, right? So very similar to a server. You've got some slots here on the left where I can insert and remove different peripherals quite easily. I can expand it and add additional connectivity as I need it. I've got my ethernet ports, these particular ports and these particular ports to the right, right here, providing different functionality. So these ports being for my management so I can remotely log in to the SAN and control that SAN. Most SANs, it really depends on the vendor though and, and the, the model will come with two uh, what's called SPs or storage processors. This would be the first one, this would be the second one. And that is because a SAN is generally configured and built with redundancy in mind. You will have one so that some functionality is done on this one, other is done is this one. So it is also for load balancing, but also for failover in the event that one goes down, the other one can still do its thing. So each storage processor has its own corresponding uh, management port running into it with activity running into a particular switch. And then I've also got my ports in here, which are 10 gigabit ethernet ports on both storage processors for actually my data transfer. So this SAN is set up in what's called an iSCSI connection. So I've also got a fiber channel port in there so I can run that in fiber channel as I need to and a number of additional ports depending on what my configuration needs to be. This can be, as I said, catered to how you want it. So when you are building and uh, specking out your SAN, you will request the particular parts that you want on the SAN itself. Uh, very similar to a server, uh, you've got dual powers. You've got a power on the right storage processor right here, on one of them, and then power on the other storage processor so that you've always got redundancy from a power perspective also. So I've also got some firewalls which are controlling all of my traffic. These are 40 net uh, firewalls. Um, there are other brands of firewalls such as Cisco, Juniper, Palo Alto, it really depends. We build these in twos, so two firewalls uh, so for redundancy and also for load balancing. Uh, and then above, we've got a whole heap of other infrastructure, which is, for example, your NTUs, which, which are running out onto your street, providing routing capabilities out to your ISPs. Um, you've got relevant patch panels. These are for fiber patch panels going into relevant ports. So the above would really be more for your network traffic coming in and out of your building, your pipes out to your VPN traffic, to your other sites, uh, etc. This is a rack mounted UPS. This is something that you would be using in a server room. Uh, and it's rack mounted because it is attached here to some rails and is inside of a rack server cabinet. Now really the whole point of a UPS is to hold power to devices so that in the event of a power outage, you don't lose those devices, whether it be servers, etc. In the scenario here, uh, this is powering up servers and switches and firewalls, those sort of things. And it's a longer rack based unit. UPSs do come in various shapes and sizes and capacities. Some can be just stood up. Normally they can be used at home, they can be used in businesses. Uh, the more, the bigger UPS is generally going to be uh, this sort of longer sort of setup and design, uh, mainly to make the most of the uh, available space that I have in a rack. All right, but this is really just a rack base, it's powered up. Uh, on the front, there's a few things there. And the whole point of the UPS is really just to keep the power on uh, to your devices, essentially your servers, your switches, your routers, uh, and provide a backup source in case the mains power goes out, your UPS takes over, and then all your devices will stay online. Uh, so obviously showing you the, uh, the hertz that are being used, the output, the battery power, etc., etc. The mains power running into here, providing power into your UPS. And then you've got the output right here, which is running into the PDU. And then in turn, the PDU has all of the devices running into it. 
Here we got a uh, rack PDU. This is a APC rack PDU. Uh, you'll see that I've got these nicely color coordinated. So you've got all your switches, your, your firewalls, your, your servers, etc., running one into the red, one into the blue, left and right power uh, for redundancy. And then of course that PDU being powered, uh, providing the power through the UPS, which is then in turn connected to the mains power. So in the event that the mains power goes out, uh, this will stay powered on because then it will take on the battery from the UPS itself. But that is really it in a nutshell. As you can see, there is a lot to talk through. There's a lot of other things that we can focus on as well. Either way, I would love it if you subscribe to my channel, Digital by Computing, and also click on that notification little bell so that you can keep up to date with my release of videos. And also like this video if you did find it helpful, comment below, and I uh, hope you found it helpful as I said, and we'll see you next time.